Was anybody else down there? Uh-oh. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you get a day off. <laughs> mm. uh, it felt too good to stay home. Oh, that's scary. Okay. Um, well, if anybody is listening out there, um, please let me know if the microphone's working. Um, so, today we're going to finish up uh, uh, physical modeling, and um, uh, there's uh, of the remaining part of the oh well of today's talk. There's really two main topics I want to talk about. Both of these are implemented in the Egan matrix, and both of them. Um, uh, have their advantages and disadvantages. Oh, excellent. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, responding there. Um, uh, so both of them have their um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, the second one I'm going to talk about has been much less discussed and uh, in academia, but is really good for the Egan matrix. Because as you know, in the Egan matrix, you have all these interactive parameters. Good morning. Um, you have. Uh, uh, you know, in every formula, you have the x, y, z uh, from what the fingers are doing. And for that, uh, it's a really great uh, algorithm because it allows you modifying things in real time, on the fly. Uh, and uh, you can get uh, nice, stable, but very variable sounds out of it. Where this first method I'm going to talk about, uh, this... Uh, Delay-based modeling or, or a waveguide modeling is uh, um, also very powerful, but uh, you can't just mess with a model and change parameters in it and still get a, um, a uh, stable result. You have to be very careful with them. And so in that way, uh, really, the, even though this is the main model, when people say physical modeling, it's like if they say PC. They, they mean a Windows uh, product. Uh, even though personal computer could mean lots of things, but they don't mean that. Well, with physical modeling, it often happens that this waveguide modeling is what people mean. Uh, despite the fact that in the Egan matrix, for instance, the, uh, um, uh, while waveguide models are very, very useful and, and do things we haven't been able to do any other way, uh, they are uh, uh, the, the second kind of modeling, the modal modeling I'll talk about, or, or resonance-based modeling. Um, is actually my favorite. But um, both are very good, and both are used together, as you will see on the next page, or one of these pages. So, um, waveguide physical models. Last time we did uh, our Carpless Strong, or a simple waveguide, Carpless and Strong actually sort of came up with this. They wrote a paper about it, made for beautiful sounds. Uh, just beautiful uh, plucked sounds. Very, very simple. Uh, very little computation time. But then, it was decades of papers, conferences, all sorts of just, just in, in crazy effort. Um, and much of what happened there is, well, what if you want these beautiful sounds to be in tune? What if you want a vibrato on your beautiful sound? What if you want a sustained beautiful sound? What if you want, you know, on and on and on. It turns out that, yeah, it's really inexpensive to get something uh, where if you don't care about the pitch, that sounds gorgeous. But uh, there's many, many other issues as I will uh, touch upon some here, and uh, for your final project, since it's not going to be presented or anything, um, if you're interested in this topic, I'd, I'd strongly suggest uh, uh, one of the things you can do is, um, I think it's on the next page. Yes, on the next page, there's an example of a waveguide physical model, which also has some resonance modeling uh, slipped in there, uh, only in a minor way. But uh, uh, figure that one out. Figure out, you know, there's a little bit of a description there. Figure out how it uh, goes around and see if you can make it sound really different. You know, see what you can do to it. Unfortunately, uh, you can do a lot of mathematical things that end up then not being stable. You know, on paper that looks good, but it's not stable in practice. Uh, or uh, uh, so on and so forth. I would suggest you have so few hours. I mean, when you're talking about, you know, a couple of weeks, two hours a week, come on. Um, a real sound designer, that's, that's uh, uh, one day of work uh, starting something they're going to do for, for uh, the next few months. So, uh, so you don't really have very much time. But what you could do is just go in there and try to understand it and do perturbations, see if they do what you expect. Because if they don't do what you expect, well, the easy explanation is it's magic. But actually, 
even though I'm saying, yeah, they're, you know, the models aren't stable and so most of the time it should be predictable if, if you really understand what's going on. So, um, yeah, just try it out and uh, see what you come up with. Um, just an idea. Okay. Um, yeah, there seems to be a lot of confusion about this final project that uh, nobody is going to grade your final project, that you just do what, what you're interested in. So, uh, uh, I know that's unusual. And, uh, but if you think about it, if you step back a bit, it's also unusual that you would never do anything except when you have the gun to your head. Uh, so, so go in there and enjoy it. Uh, just do something that interests you. Uh, don't waste opportunity. Okay. So, waveguide physical models. There are more complicated models. This is a really simple, but uh, still a more complicated model than we did before, because unlike the example, uh, 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 unlike the uh, pluck uh, example I did last class, this doesn't just have one waveguide. So this is a simple violin model. The idea is here, this is um, the nut, the one end of the string away from the player. And then there's uh, the string, uh, there's a delay line for the string. Um, then there's an uh, interface here with a bow, which is a nonlinear function. So waveguides have this uh, feature that they're ideal string. You know, they're, they're sort of an ideal reflection thing. So they're always harmonic. They're, they're always totally linear. And although much of the world is linear, it turns out your ears, and what's really interesting is listening to the small nonlinear effects you get. So um, this nonlinear interface here um, is in there, so there's a bow. Um, then there's some more string, a shorter piece of, uh, uh, you know, shorter, um, up to the bridge of the violin. And there most of the energy then either gets reflected or goes into the body through the bridge, um, but some of it goes on uh, to the tailpiece. So you can make a model like this. So this is really physically modeling the different parts of the instrument, and it's kind of cool. Um, uh, there's impedances at different places here. These capital Z's here don't really refer to the delays in this case. They uh, refer to impedances. And as you've learned in physics, if you have one impedance and another impedance, uh, like most of you uh, remember an example in physics where they had a really fat rope tied to, uh, uh, connected to a thinner s uh, string, and, uh, or vice versa, and when you whip the rope, uh, you get reflections at the point where the string changes. Uh, I mean, the, the rope changes to thinner string. Um, uh, you get uh, transmission and reflection. So you have a similar thing here. You can do transmission reflection coefficients. And this isn't really new, right? When we're looking at the LPC, there was the, ver the ladder filter version of that. And that actually really represents sections, kind of, you know, round sections of, uh, uh, of an instrument, uh, of, of the... Uh, um, a circular symmetric in, uh, pipe of an instrument, and uh, there's reflections and transmissions there. So in some sense, you know, the more things differ, the more they're the same. I mean, it, it's out there, but this is a different implementation of same, and, and you get quite different uh, results and certainly have different freedoms in what you can do with it. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, uh, yes, so we have um, a reflection and transmission coefficients at the interfaces, and then we have nonlinear transfers um, the bow itself, of course, has energy in it. It vibrates too. It has rosin on it. Um, it has, you know, horsehairs uh, um, that, that, that have all sorts of characteristics. But on some basic level, you could see this to be a model. And you could use more waveguides if you wanted for the model. Uh, sorry, for the body. Right? You could add more and more of them. In practice, uh, and I don't mean to be uh, heretical against uh, what you read in academic papers, but in practice, most models I've seen, have, you know, have a single waveguide, and and, and uh, other aspects of it is what makes it really sound amazing. Or maybe two waveguides. On the next page, there's two. There's one main one and one for an overblow effect. But most of it, it's a little confusing when you get into this because there's academic papers that go crazy with all sorts of things, and then there's the practical, what do people actually do? Now, to be fair to what the people actually do, there's also the problem that... Uh, People don't have good control of models. Like if you're just going to strike something on a keyboard and just going to start it, and then eventually you're going to stop it, and maybe you have a bend wheel that, that wiggles it sometimes. I, you know, that's so little interaction that, you know, you're probably better off with a sampler. Why? Well, one of the problems is, okay, let's say you have this model here of a violin, and that's sort of a simple model, but how do you figure out any of these parameters? How do you figure out the impedance of the strings? How do you figure out what the transfer to the bow is? How do you figure out 
what, how the bridge operates. How do you figure out, you know, and, and I'm not even saying figure out like perfectly, how do you even approximate it? Especially in a way that ends up being, you know, uh, uh, stable and doesn't just explode when you try to compute the math. And that's actually very hard. So figuring out the parameters in a waveguide system is very difficult. And you can approximate them, you can, you know, but everything is, uh, or you can try to measure them, but everything is, uh, it, it's a hard thing because things are recirculating all the time. So if you have any sorts of errors, they, well, they recirculate like crazy. They don't die out or anything. Uh, or, and, and so you have to be very, uh, it is a real challenge to do this well. There are people who know how to do this. And so I would strongly suggest on the bottom of the next page, for instance, uh, you usually, when you talk to somebody that does waveguides, uh, in fact, the next page was designed by Christophe Duquesne, uh, then with some um, uh, minor changes by Ed Egan. But, but uh, at the, you know, he told me, hey, uh, well, of course, uh, the, the general uh, academic reference is uh, a book about this thick uh, that, uh, uh, by Julius Smith and Stanford. But then you also find people online that maybe have m very little math, but really talk about practical implementation issues. Because if you don't do that, uh, you won't get very far. So it's good to understand the theory, but it's also good to realize, hey, well, you know, when you do these implementations, anything that's time domain like this, you know, just simple things about exactly what is your sample rate exactly, uh, because you know, a string can be any length, right? But these are inherently everything is quantized to your sample rate, and then you're trying to interpolate between those samples. And like last time, we talked about various fractional sample delays and stuff, but all these things are quite complicated. Um, and then that's complicated further by the fact that when you have uh, reflection filters, you know, when it's not just a straight reflection, well, those filters have group delays, right? It takes a while for some a sound to go through it, except it, it, it's, not, it's not the same at all frequencies. Some frequencies are different than others. And if your filter is slightly changing for, uh, for other reasons, then that delay also changes. So everything is so interconnected. Uh, it's very hard to uh, do well. You'll find the same thing with that kinetic model that I mentioned last time. It's also a time domain model. Very cool, very useful, but also very touchy. You know, you change some tiny little thing, and, it, and if the implementation, if the code had been just slightly different, you would have gotten a very different result. So keep that in mind. You know, that, that's one thing that I really like about, you know, in, in a sense I call this delay-based because uh, you know, just so you think, yeah, you're, you're doing delays of waves. Uh, you either go down a string or uh, uh, down a pipe or whatever it is. Um, uh, another way to think of it is time domain. You know, you're really talking about this time, this is going on. Where the next physical modeling is more frequency domain. You're talking about, well, you just talk about the resonances and how they're behaving. Uh, both are totally valid, just like time domain, frequency domain are always totally valid. And, and they do different things. But um, this is more of a challenge than it'll look like on paper. And if you want to get into it in the Egan matrix in a few hours, you have to hey, pick something that works, that interests you. OK, so waveguides usually encode displacement in the right going and left going wave that we talked about last time. But it doesn't need to. Like, if, for instance, if you're bowing something, sometimes it's useful to have a slope or velocity value. So what's a slope mean? It means like, well, uh, the slope of the string and um, uh, then it could also be the velocity of the string. And um, often, it doesn't really matter what you encode. It matters for mathematical stability, so I, I don't want to gloss over it. But the other thing that really, uh, uh, that's also very, you're always going to have math stability issues. But um, another thing that's really nice is if you can make this Boeing interface here something that's easy to compute. Because everything else about waveguides is really simple. I mean, you just have delay lines and some simple interpolation filters, usually your low-pass filters or other filters you have in there, are really simple filters. I don't know if you remember last time, I mean, you know, they're single pole filters and things like that. So, um, yeah. Um, okay. So, one thing that is very common to add to waveguide physical models and in even the, the you know, I talk about uh, the... Uh, Next modeling, the modal modeling, or, the, uh, or, or you know, the, the resonance, uh, more frequency domain best model, you still like uh, the, this uh, nonlinear feedback is still super useful in those models. And sort of, you know, this nonlinear feedback, in a sense, helps many sounds come alive. Uh, and it's just so fundamental to what's happening in nature that, that it's useful, but it also uh, is quite complicated. 
uh, one of the problems digitally is that uh, when you do this nonlinear stuff, well, you're generating harmonics. So now you have to deal with aliasing, right? I mean, something is going on. Now, if you're aliasing, if you can keep it under control, it's okay. But most of the time we're looking at this and we're just looking at, well, what are amplitudes? You know, what, like this graph here is how much flow is there, which is just sort of a, the amplitude of a signal. But you're not really considering in this, well, you know, what is the harmonic distortion? And the harmonic distortion is too simple a word, you know. What happens to the spectrum? Um, well, engineers always like to be in control, and maybe part of it here is that uh, not being in control is, is also good. So I'm not, you know, when I say, well, there's this problem, that problem, some of the problems are uh, really what make, well, makes it hard to implement, but at the same time also makes it uh, uh, interesting to, to listen to in the end uh, once you do get it going. So what is um, nonlinear elements? Well, uh, let's, there's a little picture here, but let's first talk about reed instruments. Uh, now, even with a single waveguide, like this little thing here has a single waveguide in it, um, and it, it, it's a, uh, uh, you, you know, it's got a bell, it's got a mouthpiece, and it's got a reed, which is modeled by this uh, very simple setup here. So what happens here? You got the single waveguide, you got the uh, audio out, you got a very simple feedback filter. Like, you know, simple filters work great in waveguides. They're, they're still really hard to, <laughs> to uh, deal with, but you know, you don't have 20 pole filters here. Yeah, don't mess with that. Yeah, simple things work, and you know, it sort of makes sense. I mean, if this is going to be somewhat like in time domain, well, in nature, you don't have 20 pole filters. It's extremely rare. Almost always, you know, you have really light filtering, but you have these feedback systems, and. And that's what makes it, uh, 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 and, and yeah, so, so it makes sense that these would be simple filters. And then, um, in addition, though, there's this whole mouthpiece uh, uh, simulation. Um, now, this function here and this function here are actually sort of similar. What you'll see here is that um, y here you have uh, the input here is a uh, mouth pressure minus the pressure uh, inside the pipe. So, so basically, you got some pipe, air's reflecting back and forth in it. So this, the big P is your mouth pressure, which isn't constant, but for purposes of this graph, it's basically DC. Your mouth isn't changing at the audio rate. Your mouth is changing pressure much slower uh, on the order of uh, maybe, uh, you know, tenths of seconds uh, kind of changes, um, where the uh, P sub T, that's really the audio wave being reflected in the pipe. And then the question is, well, how much flow do you get? First thing, this graph here uh, goes up and back down again, where this graph here, all it's doing is going down. In fact, it's not even trying to, it's just trying to, you know, if you get this effect at all. The exact shape of this uh, certainly matters, but it's, you know, if you do this at all, uh, you're 99% of the way there. And then after that, yeah, you can mess with the exact shape, and, and uh, uh, but, uh, um, this kind of shape is important. What's important is that when the pressure difference in your mouth and in the pipe is near zero, there's almost no flow, and when it's high, there's almost no flow. Now, from a simple time domain amplitude thing, yeah, this is good for feedback, right? Because you got feedback, if you got a whole bunch of feedback, well, it gets squished. So your system doesn't explode. So in some fundamental way, this is, you know, makes sense. Um, I will talk about the actual read, too. It makes sense in nature, too, it turns out. Um, but what is this implementation? This is just a numeric thing that you often see. What happens here is there's two parts to this. There's this one table lookup, uh, which is high and then goes down. In this case, just with some line segments, because this was long ago. But, you know, you could do a smoother function there, do something else. Uh, um, and then you got this external multiply here. Well, this external multiply, if P mi a big P minus P, which is, in this case, corresponds to this lower line here, um, uh, uh, if that is near zero, this multiply will squish it down to zero. Right? So you have this, this thing here, but you also have this external multiply. And these two things combined are at least an approximation to the same function. Does that make any sense? The other thing uh, to consider here, which is just a little detail, but somebody asked last time was kind of confused by it. So sometimes the details, I can mention the details, and if you hadn't thought of it, then 
It's just more stuff. Uh, but if you had thought of it, then it doesn't make any sense. So the other thing is, this is an all positive function. Well, this is really an amplitude function, a magnitude function. Uh, yeah, but an overall amplitude function. These are really samples here multiplied already by their amplitude. So um, it turns out that this thing here also makes it a positive and negative function. We, let's not get into all that. Um, I'm happy to talk to you guys about it later. But anyway, this is um, an overall amplitude. Um, so what's going on here? Well, this is the mouth, again, the difference between pressure in the mouth and pressure in the pipe, uh, you know, what's reflected uh, in a pipe. If uh, uh, the pressure in the mouth is low, I mean, the difference between pressure in the mouth and pressure in the pipe is low, well, there's very little pushing the air in, so there's very little flow. You know, that's actually sort of the obvious case. It's like, well, if you ain't blowing in it. Now, the thing to keep in mind, though, is this, this here is a reflected wave. So even if you have a pretty good pressure in your mouth, well, the pressure in the pipe is changing all the time. So at some points during your uh, uh, blowing into the pipe, they're almost the same. And when they're almost the same, well, there's a little flow. Um, now, if the pressure in your mouth is a little bit bigger than what's in the pipe at this time, then you get more flow. That makes sense. And what, what's really important, though, is and why reed instruments are reed instruments, is if the pressure is really different, then what happens is this reed here, it's getting caught in this breeze, right? And, and if the uh, pressure is, is enough, the reed closes. And you're just blowing against the reed. You're not, you're not getting a lot of flow into the instrument at all. Right, and obviously, you know, and reed players spend a lot of time adjusting the reeds and, and, and getting it exactly right because this isn't a, you know, a trivial thing going on here. But um, yeah, if you get it exactly right, then uh, you have this effect. And uh, so, um, uh, as far as we're concerned, in a, in a digital system, it means your feedback doesn't explode, right? Uh, you, uh, if you remember the Tacoma Narrows Bridge or whatever, you know, any of these things where you keep having more energy put in and it builds up and builds up and builds up in the system, well, everything falls apart. Um, well, here you can't get that. You can't keep adding more energy in because whenever there's a lot of energy built up in here, the reed is closed. So you're good. And, and that kind of setup um, is, is uh, super useful. Okay, so uh, what about reed instruments? Uh, or count a lot of things as reeds in, just for this purpose. I'm not trying to offend any flute players that uh, say, I don't have a reed. Um, but uh, a single reed is like a sax and a clarinet, sort of like what this picture with orange lips here is. Um, the, uh, uh, I didn't draw that, by the way, not my fault. So I have reference at the bottom if you don't like the orange lips. Um, uh, double reed, uh, like oboe or bassoon, and, and that makes sense, right? So those are, those are all reed instruments. But then there's um, air reeds, uh, as we call them, because they don't really have a physical reed. But there's very much this effect going on in a flute. And so what happens is, uh, how does that happen there? Well, you have this air jet that either uh, permits or doesn't permit uh, uh, more energy to go into, you know, you're blowing a cross flute. In fact, if you've never played flute before, it's hard to get a reasonable sound out of it. I mean, this is a real trick to get this set up. Um, and yeah, you know, flute players make it look easy, but that's because they're really good at it. Uh, so, uh, so there's air reeds and organ pipes. Some organ pipes have similar things. Some organ pipes actually have actual reeds in them too. Uh, physical reeds, there's all sorts of things in, in organs. Remember that organs are basically, you know, the, the music synthesizers from before uh, electronics and even after electronics, but um, a, a pipe organ can make all sorts of different sounds um, that, to greater or lesser extent, really do mimic um, uh, or, or at least hearken to um, other instruments. Okay, and then you've got the brass. Again, they're, they're, your lips are forming a similar function. And uh, again, brass players, you know, if you've never played a trumpet or, or a trombone before, boy, it, it's, it's hard to get a reasonable sound out of it. Kind of fun, though. Okay, so uh, any questions about that? Seem okay? So this is really, you know, waveguides themselves are linear, they're just delays. And the only thing you gotta worry about as well is my delay the right length for the pitch I want. And there you gotta watch out for, when you say is the delay the right length, it's not just a delay line here which is uh, 
uh, like we call the body of the instrument or these big Zs, but it's also all the filters have a little bit of delay through them. So it's hard to figure out exactly what your total delay is. But anyway, um, with some effort, uh, you can get it in tune. All right. So now I want to talk about um, uh, a waveguide or, or delay-based model inside the Egan matrix. And uh, I won't be able to project this whole thing, but here's an image of it. Is that readable? Eh. Doesn't matter that much. Um, I, I, I won't uh, go through the uh, image that much. You can um, uh, you can trace through this if you like. You know, if, if you go to the lab and you want to just sort of figure out where it goes. Um, it's kind of funny with these things because uh, sound designers that, that are really good at the Egan matrix always start out drawing things out other ways, and then transferring the Egan matrix is sort of a long process. It takes a long time, a lot more than a semester of, of labs, I can tell you, before you actually start thinking, you know, because the Egan matrix is also a way of drawing things out, and it's okay, but it's different than what anybody would do on their own. So um, it takes a long time before people uh, actually sort of think in, in the matrix terms directly, and it doesn't matter. You know, that's a small part of doing things, so you draw it out other ways first, and then, then you implement it. Um, in this one, you can see there's a few places where there's cube functions, and uh, again, you can experiment with those if you make them squared. A real practical thing, if you've got an audio signal, right, and you square it, it becomes all positive. You have a huge DC issue. If you do cubing, you have less of that DC issue. But also, if you look at the kind of distortion that cubing does, it's just really different. Like if you're squaring, and well, if you had a pure sine wave, it would just be an octave up with offset. Um, but if you have cubing, you get two harmonics, and you, and you still have the the fundamental. I mean, it, it really musically ends up being quite different. You can mathematically analyze all these things, but what they really mean musically is, is uh, yet another thing. Another thing I wanted to point out about this is uh, we've got these funny graphs up here, uh, which we call pitch trim graphs. And again, that's something uh, that y you don't need to mess with. Uh, you know, it's just a sort of a detail. Um, I think it's pretty close on this one. Some of the waveguide sounds, I actually, they really have to be improved. But what, what is this? Well, the person who designs the waveguide model, in this case, Christophe Duquesne, a, um, a French colleague of mine, um, uh, they uh, design the sound, and they try to get it in tune just by adjusting the model. And then eventually, you just give up. You know, if across a big pitch range, you can get within a half step of the actual pitches you want, that's pretty good. And then you make a uh, sort of a post-processing cheat, uh, which I just implemented because I figured, well, you know, when people press the continuum, it's hard enough that to try to play accurately and do audio feedback. But if I, in addition to that, the markings are half step off from or two half steps off from where you're actually trying to play, that's just too mean. So what we do here, um, and for keyboard input or something, this is absolutely essential. Um, so what this is, it's a pitch correction graph. And actually, it's going to be a bigger issue as we go uh, and uh, work with the other French company that, um, to, to make the Osmos, the, this keyboard, because on the continuum, people are used to always adjusting your finger. So if it's within, you know, reasonably close, well, you adjust your finger as you play. It's sort of up to you to do the right thing. If you're playing a keyboard and you hit a C, you want to hear a C. And, you know, there, there is none, none of this, oh, well, then you correct its pitch. Um, so we don't have the cheat anymore of the human and the feedback loop in that sense. A keyboard, in some sense, is a more limited form of what the continuum is. And, and so we can't make use of the human as well, so we got to work on these graphs. But all these graphs are is once you get it all done and as in tune as you can get the model itself to be inherently, then these are just pitch corrections for different parts of the uh, scale. So you put down your finger, you're trying to get a C. Uh, it does a, uh, basically a, a table, well, an interpolation lookup, and it tries to figure out, okay, well, whenever you play, you know, uh, octave below middle C or whatever it is, you actually... Uh, uh, pretend you're playing 118 cents up, and then you give that to the synthesizer, and then the synthesizer actually makes a C because it's a bit out of tune. Uh, so it's sort of a hack. Um, oh well, uh, that's the way it goes, but but it works, and you know it's practical, and it's one of the really fundamental things you got to deal with when you're doing these uh, uh, time domain uh, uh, delay-based uh, waveguide models. So this is a tin whistle, tin whistle sounds. Lots of things we could talk about here. Right now, um, uh, this finger-weighted uh, portamento, which a uh, pressure-weighted portamento, which is uh, 
um, used in this is uh, getting a lot of uh, national attention or international attention because we're um, because it's going to be available for keyboards and people with keyboards have never done this. In fact, there hasn't been a keyboard ever that had accurate enough sensing to do it until this French company we're working with. Um, but what does that mean? Well, it means you're only playing a single line. But pressure weight of portamento is what it sounds like. If you're playing two different pitches, you're getting only one note out, but it's uh, somewhere between those two pitches weighted by your finger pressure. So it's really you know, sort of an obvious idea. It's not. It's not uh, uh, a totally bizarro idea. It's just not something that people do, mostly because the sensing technology isn't there, I think. Uh, it's something we patented years ago, but actually our patent wasn't really intended to keep other people from doing it. It was just so that nobody could tell us one day, hey, you can't do that. <laughs> I have a patent. So um, sometimes you get patents for all sorts of reasons. But in any case, um, so it's a... Um, uh, that really helps with something like a tin whistle or, or anything that has a lot of sliding sounds that you might want to do. Uh, because uh, unlike a portamento on a keyboard where you say a portamento time or a portamento rate and it, they're all sort of the same and it's sort of an antiseptic thing, here every slide between notes is controlled and different. And again, person tries, you know, maybe the person's even trying to do the same speed slide all the time, but by not quite getting there it's more musical. Okay, so the micro delay bank, what's going on here? As I said, this is really uh, a single delay line with extras. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, there is, uh, uh, the primary delay line is actually in this micro delay here, the second, oh, you can't see that part, but the second delay, or tap two out of the micro delay, uh, the second delay in the uh, uh, micro delay is actually the main, the main thing going on here. And it goes to the master, to the master section, which means that you actually hear its output. You know, it's sort of traditional in single uh, delay line systems. But actually, if you look at it, only uh, the right channel of the output, it comes from this one. The second delay line supplies the left channel of the output. And the second uh, delay line um, uh, is to add interest and more features of the instrument. One of them is um, for the overblow effect. So if you blow hard, it goes up. And it's very pretty. And if you do that in a controlled way, it's a gorgeous effect. So um, it also, of course, there's uh, cross connections here. It also feeds back into the uh, first delay line. And then it also has this nonlinear um, feedback. Uh, uh, so so it, it, it goes um, uh, through a wave shaper, which is a nonlinear uh, table lookup, as you know. Um, or actually, it's a function evaluation here. And uh, then it goes through a biquad bank to shape its spectrum. Um, and then uh, it, yeah, so, so there's all this stuff going on here. Um, uh, there's also an excitation part of this. So there's a white noise excitation uh, uh, during the attack. Uh, uh, you got to get some energy in there. And that goes from low pass filters and, uh, and cubic functions. So it's basically just shaping the uh, input. Now, uh, yeah, uh, th there may be other ways to do that. Uh, if you had another year to work on this, one thing to try here is to use the kinetic model instead of this setup, because you can do a lot more different shaping of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the noise coming in to, to excite this thing, and you might be, get some very interesting sounds out of it. And a lot of the sound designers, like the, the top sound designers, if you look in Hollywood or something, what they'll do is when they don't have a gig going, which is most of the time, they just try things. And they may you know, go into something like this without actually even looking for a particular sound. They just say, well, I wonder what happens here. And then you know, something crazy comes out of it, and they sort of find this world of timbres, and they're their timbres, you know. So now they got this thing that next time uh, there's a big movie and there's some sound effect and, you know, they're, they're auditioning what, what are different people's ideas for who would get the job to do. Uh, they have something to show. They say, look, I could use this and talk about how they would modify it in order to uh, really do something new and effective for the movie. So, um, yeah. So, so the white noise excitation here, this was done actually before there was a, the, that bank, so uh, uh, the kinetic model, so we'll see. Um, there's a lot of aliasing issues here, and uh, they can be kept under control, 
But, you know, this preset uses both cubing, which is band limited to an extent, right? A cube will at most get you the third harmonic of something. So it's not uh, of a sine wave. So it's not, you know, making infinite mass. It's not like just adding a sawtooth that doesn't have any you know, band limitation on it. Um, but still, it's sort of nice. And then it's got wave shaping. And again, the wave shaping um, uh, is also a fairly smooth function. It's not going to go crazy with the aliasing, but you've got to see what happens. On the other hand, if you have an airy sound, you know, just a little bit of aliasing, yeah. well, if you're fortunate, you don't even hear it. Um, so, uh, not necessarily bad. I have a little bit of stuff here about in the Egan matrix, how you actually do, and how this sound and other ones actually do uh, uh, a, the, wave, uh, the wave shaper. So wave shaping in general would just be a table lookup into, say, a sine wave. Uh, not a table lookup, I'm sorry, function, uh, you know, sine of x, where x is your input. Um, but here we want to actually limit x so that uh, you don't just want sine of x, you want sine of x limited, and that's what this matrix column limiter is about. And again, you can look at that a little bit. Be careful with the matrix column limiter because the same kind of mechanism is used for this kind of limiting as it would be for soft clipping. Right? This thing here clips at uh, minus pi over 2 and, minus, and pi over 2, where this thing uh, clips at minus pi and pi. So you have to scale your things right. There's actually a fair amount of skill in this that doesn't immediately meet the eye, which is really, honestly, particular to the Egan matrix as opposed to particular to your 310 experience or something. But anyway, you can look at this stuff and try to see what's going on. And for instance, you can turn off the matrix column limiter and see what happens. Uh, turn down the volume before you do that because we don't want to blow the speakers either. But you know, uh, when you're experimenting, yeah, keep the volume low until you're pretty sure that you didn't do something uh, crazy. Are we good? All right. So there's a lot of stuff written about waveguides. Uh, you know, it, it basically sort of took over the universe. And, and I think academics like to do that. They like to investigate every little corner. And uh, unfortunately, though, uh, many of the things I think uh, you end up putting a lot of energy into things that don't lead uh, very far or look really good on paper, but then aren't that useful for actual implementation. Um, on the other hand, you don't know. You know, when you start, well, maybe this will be really useful and have you know a long life, and maybe it won't. You don't really know. So uh, it, I think it's just sort of the nature of the world. Many, <laughs> just like when you take a class, will this class actually help me later in life? Uh, sort of a crapshoot. You, you don't really know. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the other things that have been done here, which, to be honest, I sort of feel like, well, you're trying to, too hard to put a, a, a uh, round peg into a square hole. You know, It just isn't worth it anymore. But here's an idea. For instance, there's many instruments that are, have nonlinear harmonics. Now, the majority of sustained stuff is harmonic. So say even if you play a drum, well, you know probably from differential equations or wherever you learned it about Bessel functions, and they actually describe what's going on on the surface. And Bessel functions aren't constant sine waves, right? They're these decaying, crazy things. Uh, and so uh, uh, the thing is, even in a drum, any drum that has a body, that's the excitation for it. So you have this nonlinear excitation, but very soon that stuff gets filtered out, uh, all the nonharmonics. Uh, uh, and the only thing that resonates for a long time is going to be things that are near harmonic because, hey, you got the body of the drum, and that's an acoustic resonator that likes harmonic things. So a lot of times it's just the very attack of things um, that are uh, nonlinear, and, so, and most of the sound actually makes sense. But then for waveguides, that's a huge, huge issue, right? The attack of things is also much of what makes a sound a beautiful sound and much of what people care about psychoacoustically, much what you listen to. So a fundamental uh, challenge in waveguides as well. When you've got a waveguide, you know, even a single waveguide, right, the first period is basically based on what did you pre-fill the waveguide with. And attacks are very hard to control. Uh, this is me speaking, but after 30 years of experience with it, I still say it. Um, there'll be others that disagree. So. Um, but, but in my book, it's very hard to control the attack to the point where 
that's really a fundamental problem. Um, here is something where even the sustain isn't uh, uh, harmonic. Uh, so waveguides inherently are harmonic sounds and may be considered harmonic resonators. I got that term from symbolic sound. I don't know if it's a general term or if it's just one they use. But yeah, it's a harmonic resonator because just like uh, a simple acoustic space is, a harmonic resonator. So banded waveguides are waveguide networks for modeling instruments that are non-harmonic. Um, anybody here know about uh, tuned gongs? Oh, uh, a little bit. Okay, well, you know, don't don't laugh too much. But I I, I'm, I don't know. I I knew a one-time terminology, but I don't play these instruments. I don't know very much about them. Um, I have a hard enough time talking about violin and viola, and that that's the thing I played for many decades. So, uh, or I still play a little bit. Um, depending on your definition of play. Uh, but in any case, um, uh, uh, let's look at tuned gongs. So tuned gongs uh, are, is a circular uh, uh, gong, but in the center it's got a bump. And I know that's not the word for it, so I'm, I'm sorry. I, no disrespect intended. But the bump is very carefully shaped, and that tunes the main resonance you hear in the instrument. So what happens here is uh, in order for it to keep playing a long time, you need a closed path for a, a wave to take, either in, you know, whatever the medium is here, through the metal. You need a closed uh, uh, reflection path that it can, so it can repeat over and over again. If it doesn't, if it's not a closed path, if it doesn't meet itself again, it's going to die out pretty quick. Uh, that doesn't mean it's unimportant, but it just dies out pretty quick. So if you want to do the sustained part of the sound, we're not even just talking about the tax here. We're talking about the sustained part of the sound, and you have something like this. Well, you've got this path here, which is, yeah, you know, uh, uh, the thing that's mainly going to determine the pitch uh, 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 based on how how the bump is uh, made in the center. So in a delay uh, in a delay line. They're harmonic resonators. You, you can just do harmonic things. So instead, what they do is you, now you do a bandpass filter, a narrow bandpass filter. And what that does for you is it basically picks out one harmonic. I don't know. You know, by the time you're doing this, a lot of the magic of waveguides is gone. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't really see it as, uh, uh, you know, that great a model. I mean, you're, you're trying to put one thing into another. I don't know. People do abandoned waveguides. Um, it is what it is. Um, um, anyway, so there's also other resonance paths here, like uh, just from uh, the center to the outside and back and forth, right? So there's other ones, and uh, you might, in this uh, picture here, there's three uh, main resonances you want to do. But come on, if you want to do resonances, take a serious look at the next thing we're going to talk about, um, because uh, this is... Uh, um, Maybe useful, and also sometimes you know, even if you're doing a kind of odd way of modeling something that where where the technology doesn't really fit very well, um, you may still have super interesting results. My favorite example is always a harp, right? Anybody, you know, if somebody did the harp as a project in, in an instrument building school and they made the first harp, they'd get an F minus. I mean, here's an instrument where the strings pull on the soundboard in the wrong direction, in the weakest direction. You know, the instrument is constantly ripping itself apart. <laughs> what is that? You know, it's, it's just pathetic. Except that it sounds so good that over thousands and thousands of years it survived as an important instrument. Um, despite being such a hassle. You know, it's almost impossible to make in tune. Uh, you're always tuning it or playing out of tune, as harpists say. Um, uh, they have to be rebuilt from ground up, you know, pretty often. Uh, just lots of problems with it. But uh, good luck making a substitute sound. I know synth people say, well, I'll just sample one and then I'll be done. But uh, realistically, um, yeah, you know, it's a great instrument. It'll still be here a thousand years from now, too. Um, so, so it's not always, I can't say for sure that this is uh, not very useful, but it's certainly a, a funny fit of technology. Um, yeah, so other uh, good transient responses are difficult. Uh, parameter measurements are difficult. Um, then there's also other things like waveguide meshes, where you have a delay of one and it connects to some, you know, you can do this in two dimensions or three dimensions or uh, you know, go to six dimensions if you want. It just all seems a bit silly. And at this point, you know, there's a lot of information about finite element uh, simulations. Uh, there's a lot of other things you could be doing. I'm not sure if trying to cover the world with this exact approach to every kind of modeling uh, makes that much sense. 
but uh, being that we're in academia, um, uh, certainly people have tried, and uh, uh, yeah, it's something to think about anyway. Um, you don't need to take my uh, uh, word on it, but yeah, for me this seems a bit odd. But there's a lot of things about waveguides that are surprisingly cool. One of them is parallel waveguides. You know, even simple ones uh, are, can be uh, really nice for percussion. Um, but there's also like this feedback delay, uh, feedback delay networks. Now, I believe, I hope I'm not uh, putting the wrong intention on somebody here, but I believe these were originally done really um, because people wanted to do room reverberation. So they thought, well, okay, if, say here, I have three delay lines. And then um, uh, you have this matrix. So what is this? This is just all these delay lines uh, cross-connected different ways. Right, so the output of this delay line can go uh, go to some extent to all three. Output of this one to all three. The output of this one to all three. So they're all cross connected, and it seems like wow, you know, that seems pretty complicated. Um, you should be able to do uh, 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 reverberation that way. Um, it turns out reverberation is pretty complicated, and and you know, in a sense, this does uh, three main reflection paths. But you know, even a simple rectangular room, there's a there's a lot more going on there. It doesn't really do dispersion effects. Like when something reflects from the wall, you know, what's a specular reflection? Well, I don't know. I don't think, as far as I know, there. If you ever find a book of specular reflections of different materials, that'd be great. But I, I don't even think anybody's ever done that. Audio isn't to that point yet. Um, we mostly just do sampling. But in any case, um, for for visual stuff, it's certainly available. But for audio, I don't think it is. Um, in any case, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, there's a single pole filter in the feedback here, which helps. And, and sort of maybe you can see as an approximation of that, that's fine. In the Egan matrix, if you look in the filter column, there's a single pole filter that lets you, uh, oscillator filter area, uh, there's a single pole filter that uh, lets you. Uh, 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 also feed in um, uh, delay taps. From uh, you can look at that if you want, or or look at this particular sound. In any case, this uh, this thing here is called bacteria, and what you hear is like, well, is this a good room reverberation? Well, clearly not, but it's really cool, and for an imaginary sci-fi room, uh, it might be exactly what you want. And anyway, you know, hey, if it's really cool, uh, why not? So here we go. This is called bacteria, uh, which is, again, Christophe Duquesne, um, uh, I believe designed the sound, but Ed Egan played this.
So that was played by Ed Egan. Actually, all the examples I'm going to play today, except for a few where I'll, I'll mention something, were played by him. So he does a large variety of things. But this thing, I don't know, it's quite beautiful in its own right. Um, so uh, uh, is it a great reverb algorithm? Well, again, you know, the answer depends on what you want. Now, this wasn't trying to do a natural room anyway, so the natural room might sound a little bit better. But, uh, or a little bit more like a natural room. But you know, if you really want a natural room, it's again the sampling thing. Um, hey, uh, in the next page, Ed Egan, for one of the pieces, used a sampled impulse response, you know, a, a, a sample response of a Helgrimskirche uh, or something, uh, uh, some cathedral in Europe, because, well, that's really what he wanted. You know, he didn't want the extra metallic thing, and, and there's beautiful space there, why not use it? Uh, so uh, that's, that's what, uh, it's a convolution reverb and, uh, on one of those. Uh, so all sorts of things are available to you. Questions about that? Good? All right. So now I'm going to, I want to do uh, what's called modal physical modeling, a very unfortunate term, because not only is it not the main thing that academics do, but uh, modal and model, Google knows you just misspelled one word and it looks like model physical modeling. And anyway, so you, you don't ever find what you actually are looking for. Um, uh, you can also call it resonance based modeling, or in a sense, I think of this more of as in frequency domain modeling. And often people think, oh, it's frequency domain, so it's like not really a model. Um, I don't know. I think time domain, frequency domain deserve equal rights. Uh, so I'm not sure that's true. Um, but it is also, at least the way we use it in the Egan matrix, is a super simplified model. Uh, you know, I don't get the idea that, oh, well, this is somehow more correct than waveguide models. Absolutely not. It's got a different set of issues about it, but one of the nice things about it is it's very controllable. So what's happening uh, with this here? And modal physical modeling does have a long history in architecture, uh, even the way that uh, uh, we use it in the Egan matrix. Um, and uh, it's been, it has some history in music. We certainly didn't invent it. Uh, so, uh, but it's, it's not very much used in music. Normally, if you hear physical modeling, people mean uh, waveguide modeling. So in the Egan matrix, uh, we model the overall resonance of an instrument. And this idea I've seen in architecture, and then um, I've also seen it you know, in symbolic sound, had implementations like this. Uh, uh, what, what, what are we talking about here? Well, say, say in architecture you want to make an earthquake proof. Uh, and, you know, I say it's a five-story building. And if on the second floor there's a vase on a table that falls off the table and breaks, you know, you don't really care. Uh, it, it's not because you don't care about the vase, but, but your, your concerns are different. Your concern is, will the building collapse? And uh, so, you, so what you're really looking for is overall, what are the main resonances of this big structure? Now, the big structure is complicated, right? Because you've got bricks and mortar and metal beams and, and tables and vases inside it. You know, and all of these things, to greater or lesser extent, might contribute to the, uh, uh, to the main uh, vibrations and, and main oscillations of the building. Uh, but still, you try to model just the main ones. And that's sort of the idea of what we're doing in the Egan matrix when we do this. Um, I wanted to mention that because it really, even though it uses the same underlying technology, it's very different and very much simpler than your homework paper. So you got a new homework today. Um, it'll be due next Thursday. We're going to do homeworks due on Thursday just because you had that day off. Um, so, um, uh, what was I saying here? Yeah, so it's, so it's much simpler than the homework because in the homework what's happening is you actually, the counterpart would be, you actually do model each brick. You model the vase. You model the table. You model the table's legs and how they interact with the floor and how the vase interacts with the table and so on and so forth. You model all the parts and then you put it all together. Now, in that, in that example, there aren't that many parts, right? You can model, you know, e each molecule if you want, right? There, there's all different levels you model on, but, um, but um, still that paper models different parts. For instance, the soundboard of the piano would be a separate model from the strings, would be a separate model from so on and so forth. So, uh, so this is much simpler. I wanted to mention, since I'm talking about that homework now, um, 
don't kill yourself with this homework, right? And once you get out of school and you actually are interested in something, you don't have this ridiculous time pressure on you where you try to get something done in one evening. Um, I read that paper over and over and over again at the coffee shop for weeks before I really understood it. And I, I actually, when I first saw it, I just giggled and said, ah, another IEEE paper with lots of math. Here's somebody who uses, you know, uh, uh, wave equations and materials of, of of, of uh, what that the strings are made of and stuff, and tries to model piano and you know, uh, and then I was really tickled because they actually had a sound example attached to the paper, so I was ready to listen to sound example and was thinking, well, will it sound more like a rubber band or more like a cowbell or more like a frog, uh, because that's the way these papers are, you know, quote always are. Anyway, I listened to it and it was amazing. It was really good. I mean, and that's the thing is you know as much as I like to make fun of. Uh, uh, sometimes when academia just does some crazy things, this may or may not eventually add up to something, but at least in the short term, it just seems silly. Uh, this thing actually worked. I, mean, I was just totally blown away. And then it took me, of course, a long time to really learn uh, what they had done. But it's amazing because it's a counterexample to what you usually hear. Normally, if you, if you try to break things down into their component parts and build up from them, your model is you're just never accurate enough. But they actually managed to do it. Uh, it's quite, quite impressive. So, when you read this paper, don't kill yourself for it. Look at the homework questions. And I would suggest the first time, just sort of skim through it and get the general layout of the paper and just sort of, you know, understand what it is. And then the next time, read it more carefully, but also just look for the answers to the questions and anything else you want. You know, it's sort of your own time. You're supposed to spend four hours on this, but I certainly needed at least 100 hours to really figure out what's going on. And, uh, you know, and I wasn't yeah, under the time pressure you were and stuff, and I enjoyed doing it. Um, uh, but so, uh, yeah, so be careful about the homework. Um, don't blow it off, but um, at the same time, you know, don't try to understand every detail of it. Um, um, but I am uh, very impressed with that paper. Still, if I could implement that in the Egan matrix, we don't really have all the things you need to do it. If I could, would it really be the right thing for the Egan matrix? And the answer is no. Because one of the nice things about the, this resonance models in the Egan matrix, if you have two different sets of major resonances of systems, you can interpolate between the two and you still have something stable. So you can do all sorts of morphing in a simulation way that's absolutely impossible with uh, waveguide models and such. You know, you, you can do, like with waveguide models, you can, like the uh, VL synths and stuff, you can look at them and they do very nice synthesis for the things they have set up, but once you start messing with the parameters, you find out there, there isn't very far to go with it. The sounds are what they are, and you can't manipulate them much. So I guess if you want exactly those sounds, it's okay, but a lot of times people want to take it other places, and uh, with the Egan matrix and with this kind of modeling, overall system modeling, you can do that. Um, there are people that model musical instruments from ground up, uh, Aircom has a, a large modeling group, again, much more sophisticated than what we do in the Egan matrix, but um, now, you know, this is my understanding of it, I haven't actually used their system, but uh, from what I can tell, it isn't, it doesn't actually solve the same problem. You know, that system, for instance, say you wanted to build a new instrument, you could build up the model of all the parts of the instrument and listen to what it does, you know, it's actually really cool if you're into instrument building. But it's like into, you know, you're into the physical instrument building of the dimensions of the instrument, materials you use, and that kind of thing. And it does a wonderful model of that, but if you want to, you know, morph between one kind of instrument and another, it's very, you know, they're going to have different structures, you can't really do that. And um, so anyway, so in the Egan matrix, uh, this has been uh, very useful, despite how simple it is. Um, uh, in academia, you know, if you're, the, the simpler your math is, the less interesting it is. And if you solve the world hunger problem and your math is boring, nobody cares. Uh, so you got to be a little bit careful with what you see published. As I say, some of it's great, some of it isn't. Some of it may be on the step of something, uh, on the way to something great. Okay, so bandpass filters uh, here. Let's say we talk about resonances. Well, let's get even lower level. You know, bi-quad bandpass filters, that's what I actually use, so hey, might as well say that. Uh, uh, simple bi-quad bandpass filters are, uh, are very different from waveguides because they can be harmonic or not harmonic. 
each bandpass filter, you can control its bandwidth uh, and uh, its frequency, which sort of, in a waveguide model, that is a result of your waveguide and your system that you're simulating. It's not, you don't directly control it. So in some ways, waveguide models are really more magical because you're doing a time domain simulation of something and then you listen, hey, does it work in frequency domain? You know, does the overblow effect work? Does this or does that work? Um, and it's kind of cool. Um, another example here I should, uh, since I'm talking about the difference between the two, at the bottom of the page here I have less magical than waveguides. For instance, if you pluck at a different position on a string, like you have a violin string, say, or harp string or whatever, you pluck in different positions, you actually get different timbre. Why? Because if you're plucking right at a node for one of the harmonics or for multiple harmonics, you don't excite that harmonic much. But if you're um, uh, plucking at a location that would be at a peak of a harmonic, then you tend to get a lot, you know, a, a lot more. And, and you know this from if you're a guitar player, or if you're whatever, you know, lots of uh, string instruments have this issue, uh, have this thing, and it really matters. It, it, it's, a, it's a quite beautiful thing. Well, if you have a waveguide model, you have physically a location along your delay line that you're putting in the energy. And the right thing happens. You get the right harmonics if your model is good. But if you're doing this modal modeling, you actually have to explicitly set your harmonic amplitudes. And it's a simple function. You got this amplitude of the nth harmonic is this here, um, where it depends on uh, uh, your position 0 to 1 here on the string. Um, and you know, it's okay, but it's sort of like, well, it's kind of cool when it just magically happens, right? One of the cool things, in fact, if you want to play with waveguide models, you know, that's one thing to do is take a waveguide, um, uh, make it split it into two uh, waveguides so that you can add energy at the right place in the Egan matrix and, and make that dynamic. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You know, it, it actually sort of does the right thing. Now, it'll take you a while to set that up, even if you're going to spend the whole rest of the semester trying to do what I just said, you know, make a string where you plug at different locations and automatically the waveguide works, I'd be impressed if you can get it done by the end of the semester. You know, it's just hard to do these things. Maybe you're better off taking the last few hours you have and just experimenting with things that already work instead of getting frustrated with, well, yeah, what is wrong here, you know, and after 100 hours you would have learned something, but you don't have 100 hours. All right, so, so there are some cool things about the time domain, you know, spatially oriented modeling as opposed to frequency domain oriented modeling. I, I'm not saying, uh, but uh, as far as, you know, controlling sounds, doing different things with them, uh, making attacks that sound good and on and on and on, uh, there's a lot of advantage to this kind of modeling. So, um, what is going on here? Each bandpass filter has a time varying control for three parameters, amplitude, center frequency, and bandwidth. Here's another thing that you got to learn though, Nothing is as easy as it sounds. When you, when you say amplitude, you're actually controlling the, the amplitude of a resonance. But that's different from how loud is what's coming out of this bandpass filter. Like, it, it, you know this, right? If you have a really narrow band bandpass filter, it can get screaming loud because it's feeding back like crazy internally, right? Each bandpass filter, if you look at what it's doing internally, it's, it's, uh, it can build up a huge amount of energy. So yes, you have the amplitude of the resonance, but that's actually not how much energy is there right now. So there's this weird relation between, well, the amplitude you want, you know, how loud do you want the thing to be? You're not directly controlling it. It's not additive sine wave synthesis. And you can actually use that to your advantage. Uh, because what you can do is like, you can have frequencies where you build up energy fast or you don't build up energy fast, um, so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not all bad. Um, you have a feedback path here where I have wave shaper here with this. This is a table lookup wave shaper. I should really update this for the Egan matrix. In the Egan matrix, you don't need this alternate path here. You just have uh, the, the wave shaper because we're doing floating point math and there's not an issue. But um, I'm going to play you a bunch of sounds, like the first eight sounds I'm going to play you all have this feedback. So I said, oh, you do the main resonances, and that's true. You do, and these things win out. But with this feedback thing, remember, these things cause harmonics and stuff. There's a lot more frequencies present than what's in these bandpass filters, you know, than the center frequencies of bandpass filters, right? There's a lot more stuff going on. Um, for instance, when you first do an input, say you do a noise burst input, what happens with a bandpass filter? 
Well, you can look at the bandpass filter in frequency domain or in time domain, but basically, uh, some percentage of it just sort of gets passed through. It takes a while for a bandpass filter to have effect on, on its input, right? So initially, like, if you get a burst of noise or you're hitting a drum head or something, whatever the spectrum of your input is is actually very important because that gets passed through. Very quickly, though, it gets shaped you know, certain re uh, these frequencies will get picked out from it. So it, it back to li likening to the drum head I was talking about. You have lots of different frequencies which have to do with two-dimensional vibrations uh, exciting the sound, but then very quickly uh, you can have harmonic or nearly harmonic um, resonances. Then if you do have feedback, which you probably wouldn't do in the drum, but if you do have feedback here, that also keeps that up. Even though these things are picking out certain resonances, this feedback distortion is again adding in frequencies all the time that really aren't these peak frequencies. And that turns out just to be a really useful, possibly hard to understand, but useful um, effect. All right. So I'm going to play, uh, oh, I've been talking a long time. I'm going to uh, play some sound examples here. Uh, here is, here is me not knowing how to do this here. Uh, what was I going to say about this here? Okay, so this one uses nonlinear feedback. Here it's really obvious because the feedback in that, uh, in that tin whistle, if you want to do overblow, it's actually very easy. You move in the Y direction. It gives you lots of direct control over it, almost the opposite of this. I mean, I say, oh, well, the time domain is more magical because... Uh, it's doing more automatically. Well, in that particular sound, this, it was sort of done in a heavy-handed way. Um, in that way, the feedback is something you're really directly controlling. In this sound that I'm playing you here, um, uh, called the modal string as a, pr a preset, but here, uh, the feedback is actually very slow, and it builds up. And you have to be careful when you play this because it will explode on you if you don't watch it. So, uh, because the energy is building up in these... Uh, uh, in these biquads, and uh, you get that feedback effect. But like, if you listen to like electric feedback guitar, or, you know those sorts of things. Those are very uh, <laughs> always walking on the edge of a cliff, right? Because the sound can explode on you. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I'm going to rudely interrupt here. So when you hear it go into higher pitch and stuff, just like you would in an acoustic instrument, you've got to back off or the thing will explode. Now, in the Egan Matrix, it just goes, you know, and people think it's broken. Well, no, it just didn't scream at you like an actual feedback system through a speaker would. Um, but uh, uh, this is very skilled playing, and, uh, yeah, I'm impressed. It's very cool. <laughs> performance class, so you're absolutely not required to do this, but since nobody's actually going to grade your final project, if you wanted to, you could find the sound. The hardware we have is older, it's less sensitive than, you know, a uh, continuum built in the last decade, but in any case, um, uh, you could try it, and just keep in mind when you hear it go, that just means you, you know, pretend that hurt, and you took a break, and came back, and, uh, and started again. But it, it's hard to play a sequence like that where you built up all that energy. It's in the, you know, in, in the uh, higher pitch range there, and uh, and you keep it. 
I actually don't know. He's a studio musician, so I don't know how often he had to try that before he got it to play right. Um, here is uh, another one. This is a uh, double reed. Let's see, what can I say about this? This is just noise into modal filter. It's the only uh, comment I have on it. All these presets are available. It noodles on, but you know, he's just noodling around. But it definitely sounds like a double read or akin to a double read. And so, yeah, what you're how you set up your uh, wave shaping feedback and how you uh, what harmonics you decide to take, right? Um, or emphasize really matters. Um, also, you hear the attack in there, the attack, especially if you listen to it on good speakers, is actually uh, a <laughs> better recording than through Echo 360 if that's what you're doing. Um, but uh, uh, the attack is actually quite nice, and that's something that's extremely difficult to do with waveguide models, short of just having, uh, uh, what most people do is just have pre-recorded um, uh, 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 excitation functions. But if you just have, you know, that, then you don't get the variation and stuff that you'd really like to have over time out of a physical model. Okay, um, here is wind-powered bicycle. Um, this is an air read. Uh, it's sort of uh, calliope-like. So Ed was saying, "Yeah, well, this is the e this was really easy to record because you know calliopes are always out of tune." So he played it really out of tune, and it's just kind of funny and cute. <laughs> I wanted to mention something here that I just noticed. Um, a lot of these models in their feedback path will have an all-pass filter. Now, the delay line, um, uh, well, okay, so, so why do we have an all-pass filter here? It's not to do a fractional sample delay, right? In delay line modeling, in, 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 in uh, the time domain uh, way, uh, or spatial uh, sort of uh, uh, waveguide modeling, uh, you have to um, uh, use all-pass filters or, or uh, some sort of fractional delays. All-pass filters aren't my favorite, but th they would work. But they also can act as diffusers, because the reason I don't like all-pass filters with fractional sample delays is because they don't have very nice phase responses. On the other hand, sometimes you don't want the nice phase response. You want to diffuse the phases. And here, the main pitch is still going to be controlled by the center frequency of these over time. So uh, you can use all-pass filters as diffusers. Uh, they're not actually there to tune anything. They're just, uh, again, to, to help uh, the sound. Um, I'm going to play you the next example here. Uh, keep in mind that every one of the examples I've played uh, in this last set here, including this next one, are, um, uh, and, and, and actually the next three, are almost the same setup in the Egan matrix. They're just different formulas controlling the resonances. And then, you know, there's some feedback. I mean, there's some other differences, but the very, sort of very minor differences. If you wanted to make a sound halfway in between these or something, uh, and you were skilled at it and had the time, you could, it's a very, uh, the same structure, basically. And so that's a really big deal. That's very different from um, other modelings.
So here, um, you can see in that example, it's closer to the tin whistle, the way the over uh, blow effects and stuff were done, were just by Y position. And in a flute, I mean, if you can get that result pretty reliably if you're a good flute player, which is different than the feedback guitar-like thing where you're, you know, the exact setup you have and how far your speakers are away and all that stuff really matters for, hey, uh, how does the feedback build up? So it's appropriate uh, for what he was doing. And again, all of these have um, same setup with uh, just different parameters. I'm going to play you an example that um, uh, just a little bit of this uh, example I played previously. Um, this is uh, the uh, Gnosian uh, 3 by uh, Satie, uh, played by uh, Peter Pringle. And, and you've heard this before. Not the piano part, but the lead. So that's very beautiful, um, and you've heard it before. But the thing is, you can play that exact same sound even without changing the model, just by how you play it. You can get very different effects. This next one here is the same thing, played in a different pitch range and played in a different way, and almost sounds like a didgeridoo-like effect. <laughs> So this is without any change at all. It's like you play a violin a different way. Um, yeah, so, so and, and you know, on a violin you have that, right? If you play harmonics versus bowed versus plucked versus collegno or whatever, you know, there's so many varieties of to get very different sounds out of it. Um, that happens with the model of an instrument, too, which isn't too surprising. Uh, and here's the last example, what I was going to say about this one. I don't know. Still has wave shaping feedback. This is the last one with wave shaping feedback. want to keep you too long, so I'm going to um, play this next example. I could draw you up some shape metal bars if you're interested in that. But basically, if you have a xylophone, which is just a rectangular bar, um, what makes a xylophone so useful is this uh, octave and a tritone up harmonic. It goes plink rather than, you know, and the plink may or may not be beautiful depending on what you want. If you want it to cut through, you know, you're in a marching band and you want it to cut through, it's, it's great. I mean, you can hear a xylophone over all sorts of things. So, so it's really cool. But for a lot of musical purposes, you really don't want octave and a tritone harmonic. That's, you know, you want octave and a fifth. Um, and uh, so it's possible to shape the bar uh, to adjust the harmonic spectrum. And uh, don't have time to draw that out. But anyway, it's sort of interesting if you're into, into uh, shaped metallophones. Um, here's an example of one played. This simulation of one. There is no nonlinear feedback in this thing. And since uh, we're low on time, I'm going to rudely talk over it. One of the things here is that shape metal bars can't go very low in pitch. It, 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 you just can't tell the pitch anymore. It's too hard to do the harmonics. 
And here we just cheat because, hey, we're in the Egan Matrix. Uh, instead of following the actual harmonic pattern that shape metal bars have, we just make them more and more harmonic as you go low. So it's still reminiscent of a, a shape metal bar, but you have much bigger pitch range. I was waiting for it to go real low, but um, uh, here's uh, actually the example. This is like a crystal glass. Again, almost the same exact. If you look in the Egan matrix, different formulas, but the same as what you just heard. Um, uh, this is convolved with a uh, frequency response recorder. So it's like rubbing your finger on a wine glass. Last example of the day. Again, no feedback here. This is a resonant drum. Uh, you can listen to it as you leave. Um, uh, in this case, it's kind of funny because the intention was you just tap it. Energy goes into it. And then Ed noticed, well, if you hold your finger down, you hear more energy going in, but it doesn't really do the right thing. It just makes this hissing sound. Yeah, I can't fix it, feature it. If you don't like it, don't do that. But you'll hear it hiss when he keeps his fingers down. And of course, this isn't strictly pitched, uh, like many of us. Thank you very much. You're free to go.